good afternoon everybody first is there welcome everybody in this uh, webinar who are the participants and uh, the member present here in our conference hall in sale today there will be a lecture on tensile membrane structures we are organizing it in a hybrid mode and the lecture will be delivered by professor siddhartha ghosh from iit bombay before his presentation we would like to introduce INSDAC first to many of you. Many of you may be aware of INSDAC and our activity, but still we uh, taking advantage of this platform to share our activities with you. Our institute is a non-profit member-based organization established by Government of India, Ministry of Steel, and major steel producers in the country. And it was established in 1996 as a society Registration Act of Government of West Bengal, 1961. And it was established in, nine, in line with Steel Construction Institute, SCI UK. Apart from Ministry of Steel, our founding members are SAIL, Tata Steel, JSW Steel, Visor, and AMNS India. This uh, list showing our executive council member where we have Mr. Shoma Mandal, chairperson from Steel Authority of India. She is president of INSDEC. Mr. B. Stakrabarti, director of commercial sale, joint secretary from JPC and government of India. Mr. TV Narendran from Tata Steel. Mr. Sajan Jindal from uh, JSW Steel. Mr. Atul Bhatt from Rashtriya Ispat Nigam Limited. Mr. Dilip Umen, CEO from Arsalan Mukta and Steel Limited. Mr. Ranjan Bhatt. CEO Arsalar Mittal, Nippon Steel Lim India Limited, Mr. Ranjan Bandapadhai, Executive Secretary, Joint Plant Committee, Government of India. And also we have few academicians in our uh, Executive Council member and few emeritus professors like Dr. Prem Krishna from IIT Ruti, Dr. Anjan Ray, Director CBRI Ruti, Mr. Anupam Kumar, Vice President and Head LNT Metallurgical and Material Handling, Dr. N. Ananda Bhalli, Director, SCRC Chennai, Dr. Harshavadhan Subbarao, Chairman and MD, Consumer Consultancy, Mr. Salil Kumar, Chairman and MD, Mekon, and also our Director General, Mr. Pradeep Kumar Mishra in the EC Member Committee. This slide shows you the activities of our uh, institute. We do, project, we do some projects on steel promotion in the mission of steel promotion. After that, we made some publications. So far, we have 101 guidebooks and manual on steel design and construction. We are involved in preparation and revision of many design-related code of Bureau of Indian Standard and Indian Road Congress. We have we were actively participate uh, involved in preparation of IS 800, IS revision of IS 808, preparation of IS12778 and all um, preparation of code of 11384, which will be uh, published in revision part, it will be published very soon. And also involved in IRC codes like IRC24 and IRC22, which deals with steel bridges and steel road bridges. Also, we are involved in education and training section. We do seminars training and researcher courses on steel design and construction. So far, uh, up to 2017-18, we have organized 104 training courses and researcher courses, 22 seminars. After post-pandemic, also we have started that, uh, to organize uh, offline seminars. Last, we have organized in July, and also we, have uh, we, are, we are going to organize next one in a couple of months. We have also organizing some technical lectures. We already have started uh, to do with the help of um, many professional experts and academicians. Today also, these are one of the initiatives of this uh, education and training uh, part. We also do some design of demonstrative structures so that people are um, aware of that many structures which are in RCC based design can also be designed in steel with the effectiveness and with its benefit. We are also involved in some projects which are beneficial for user segment and also for the our founding members. We also in, are in our involved 
uh, we have involved ourselves in standardization of bridges and also some rural houses under Prime Minister Avas Yojana. These are our present activities. Uh, very recently, we are into the initiative of one step solution. We have na named this activity like this. Uh, in that part, we will try to involve ourselves from the concept to commissioning of field based structures. Another activities we are uh, working on now on life cycle cost study of steel based structures. For that, uh, we have to do the data collection, validation, and a robust study of life cycle cost. We also involved, have involved ourselves in policy intervention uh, with government. In that part, we have submitted some standardized design of field span of steel bridges, and uh, we are working for that purpose with Ministry of Road, Transport, and Highway Department. And already we have, uh, I have spoken on the refresher courses. We are still designing some courses and already we have uploaded some future training courses, which will be doing in future months. It has been uploaded in our website. We will request all of you to go to our website and also some uh, list of technical lectures, which we can deliver with with our by ourselves and also with some help of academic uh, other officials, external officials. These are also uploaded in our website. And we are now trying to develop some certificate courses on steel design and construction. We will be uh, updating all this information time to time in our website. And we will request all of you to visit our website to get all this information. We have uh, designs, instead of designed some demonstrative structure on steel composite technology. Uh, in that one example, we are giving that Indira Pariyavaran Bhavan. This we have designed for uh, Ministry of Textile. Uh, it was uh, in uh, steel concrete composite technology. In that uh, project, there was a requirement of one individual block, which had an auditorium of uh, big span like 19 meter by 24 meter area was uh, was to be constructed without any column in between. So it was designed in steel concrete composite technology. And floor to floor height was a restriction. So we went for steel concrete composite design. Next one is insert own office building. Next one we have designed handloom house for. Ministry of uh, Textile. Uh, earlier one is the Ministry for Ministry of Environment. I uh, did some mistake in uh, telling you. And another one, we are involved in inspection and supervision purpose. That is Restilo. It is a steel residential building in Kolkata. And this was in brief introduction of uh, instead. Now, uh, before uh, Professor Guru deliver his lecture, I will introduce. Him to all of you. Dr. Shridhartha Ghosh, he is, is Jitendra K. and Meena J. Mehta, Chair Professor of Structural Engineering from Department of Civil Engineering, IIT Bombay. After completing his PhD from the University of Michigan in 2003, he joined IIT Bombay, where he has held various academic positions over the last two decades. His research interests are primarily in the application of probabilistic methodology in civil infrastructure risk reduction. In recent years, he has supervised postgraduate students working in the areas of analysis and design of tensile members, membranes, value of information in structural health monitoring, risk analysis in earthquake engineering, and the use of topology opt optimization in structural design. He also manages the Structural Safety, Risk, and Reliability Lab at IIT Bombay. Professor Ghosh teaches graduate and undergraduate courses in structural engineering and probabilistic methods at IIT Bombay. He consults in areas related to structural dynamics, structural reliability, grid safety, and the design, NGT, and retrofit of steel and RC structures. Currently, he is the convener of the Bureau of Indian Standards Working Groups on Tensile Membrane Structures, CD38 Working Group 2, 
and structural health monitoring CD37 working group 5. Currently, Professor Ghosh is Dean Educational Outreach at IIT Bombay. Now, I would request Professor Siddhartha Ghosh to tell you with the main of all of us. My screen, my screen is visible, right? There's an issue, issue with the voice. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. It is not clear. It is not clear. Okay. Okay. Hello, am I audible now? Yeah. Okay. Amar, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you now. I don't know about others. That's yes, clear sir. Enough. Thank you. Yeah, we yes, can. Sir, it's clear now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I think we can start. So first of all, thank you, Nivedita, for a long introduction. A um, lot of praise, really. Uh, thank you, anyway. Uh, so today we are going to discuss about tensile membrane structures. And uh, can I go ahead or? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we'll kind of keep it informal as much as possible. And uh, then uh, we'll start uh, taking questions. Uh, but before that, I think the lecture will go for around 45 minutes, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, you're starting a little late. So I'll try to keep it uh, short if possible. Uh, this is the outline of today's lecture. So basically, you're talking about tensile membrane structures or TMS as we call them. And after an introduction, we go into form finding of TMS then load analysis, design and implementation of TMS, uh, development of an Indian standard, which will take some time and then possible future research and development, which I'll cover shortly. Uh, before I proceed, I want to give uh, the due thanks. Uh, thanks to you to Pasol Instead for arranging this uh, webinar, which you are having in a hybrid mode uh, in the SAIL conference room in Kolkata. So I'd also like to thank SAIL uh, on behalf of uh, all of us here. Uh, I would also thank uh, SERB because part of the research that is being presented here is funded by SERB. So thanks goes to them as well. And finally, my colleagues in uh, CD38WG2, and I have listed the names here. Uh, some of you are there in the audience. So thank you for being there. Uh, this uh, presentation is kind of uh, a consolidated effort of many people. Uh, including uh, the names that I have listed here, as you can see. So we'll start with a quick introduction to what tensile membrane structures are. So I think by now most of us have seen what tensile membrane structures look like. No? We may not know the name, but these are basically structures that you get to see uh, as uh, long span roofing. Uh, in airports, stadiums, parking spaces, recreational spaces, rooftops, canopies, etc. And I have cited some examples over here. And the examples come from uh, both India and abroad. So over here, an example from Turin, from Munich, uh, Denver in USA, and then from India here, India here, India here. And this is an example of a station building here, whereas this is a facade example for a library building here. Yes, we all have seen these structures, but I haven't really paid much attention in terms of their structural behavior, in terms of their structural design, etc. And this talk is basically intended towards building that kind of an awareness where we start treating these just like any other kind of structures in terms of the amount of attention that will be given for their design, for their analysis, and for their implementation. So why TMS at all? What we like about this TMS? 
Uh, the picture that you get to see over at the right side is that of uh, Munich Olympic Stadium, which was constructed in the early 70s uh, by the genius uh, named Fry Otto. He was one of the pioneering uh, researchers in the area of what we are discussing today, hence environment structures. And it was all developed in the Institute of Light Structures in University of Munich, TUM. Why do you like these structures? First of all, you can see from this, they have a really pleasing aesthetics. We like to take a look at these structures. They really look beautiful. They are lightweight and lightweight has its own advantages. For example, if you're designing against earthquakes, by reducing the mass, you can reduce the design forces significantly. So that is something which is very, very useful. Also, we can talk about efficiency. Since these are tensile structures, which means that the whole cross-section of the structural member is under tension. So unlike bending systems where the stress distribution is high somewhere and low somewhere, this region for a bending system doesn't get used up so well. So you don't make optimum use of the material. Whereas if you take a completely tensile structure, then the stresses across the cross-section will be uniform. And that's where you get a lot of material efficiency. That's what tensile structures can be. Also, they uh, result into a very low carbon footprint. You can imagine uh, that overall, uh, the amount of material use is much less. And the supporting structures will also be lighter and lighter, and they will consume much less embodied energy. Or the foundations which you have to build will be also much smaller in dimensions. So these are the definite uh, ad uh, advantages that we can take out of these structures. Now, uh, this is kind of getting uh, to know the tensing women structure in detail. As the name tells you, the primary structure is made of membrane or a fabric. And the fabric is typically made of synthetic or natural fibers, which are twisted and weaved. We'll see more about uh, this weaving later on. I know many of you who are familiar with structural engineering may not be familiar with the concept of textiles because we don't manufacture textiles. We don't use them much in our regular structural engineering. Beyond the membrane part, so this is the membrane part that you can see over here also. Here also you can see the membrane. Uh, beyond that, we have the supporting parts, including reinforcing cables. So over the edge, over here, you have a cable. Then we have uh, a mass like this. Uh, we have uh, other supporting cables, and there are anchorages for those cables, ground anchorages. And there are <coughs> connections over here. And the connections, many a times we have couplers which will be used for applying pre-stresses to these membranes. So here I've used the word already that there will be pre-stresses. And if you can look at this figure over here, these are tensile membrane structures where the frames will be along these supporting lines. And the membrane will be pre-stressed. There will be pre-stress in this direction. And pre-stress also will be acting in this direction. So these are the pre-stresses, as you can see, if you take a simple element over here. So these are typical of tensile member structures. Some other structures may have some more elements, but either a rigid frame support or a cable support is what you see, and then the frame needs other supporting elements as well. Now, TMS can be classified in many different ways, but the two broad classes are that. They are either pneumatic, which are under air pressure, and the other one, which is pre-stressed. The pre-stressed one would have an anti-clastic curvature, whereas the air pressured one will have a synclastic curvature. For today's discussion, our focus will only be into this and not into this at all. But it doesn't mean that the pneumatic structures are rare altogether. But more and more anti-clastic pre-stressed structures are getting used in today's world. So what's synclastic and what's anticlastic? This is a picture of synclastic curvature where the curvature in two orthogonal direction are in the same side. Whereas for this saddle shaped structure, it's in two different direction. So one curvature on this direction, other curvature on this direction. So this is anticlastic curvature. And these are the structures which can be held just with pre-stress applied in this direction and applied in this direction. Whereas structures like this have to be held with pneumatics. The naming of a structure can also depend on the shape of the structure. 
So to the right side, you see a figure of a hyperstructure. Uh, people who are familiar with uh, Kandela's architecture, you might have seen something similar to this where uh, he built shells in uh, masonry, which looks something like this, but this is made with tensile membranes. Uh, this is a high point structure where there is a head ring over here and uh, supporting cables at the base. But most importantly, there is a mast from which the whole thing is supported. This is in Denver International Airport in the USA. And these are Ridge Valley structures. Uh, over here, the railway platform, the uh, bottom right one, you can see it's a saddle-like structure where there are curvatures in two directions in uh, different up and down directions. Now you come to the material properties, particularly fabric, which a structural engineer is not so familiar with. So in a typical membrane, fibers are weaved along two directions, which we call warp and weft or feed. Uh, if you see to the direction over here, first you uh, lay out the weft yarn like this, and then the field in the perpendicular direction coming to each other. And then obviously after you weave this thing, there is a coating which finally give you the overall look of the structure that you get to see. So when we look at a membrane, we don't get to see the fibers, either this one or these ones, we don't get to see. What you get to see is the coating, and coating has its own purpose. Typically, uh, the coatings are uh, PVC, PVC coated polyester. The fibers are PVC coated polyester, polyester membranes. Many a times, these are PTFE coated glass fibers, so plastics or glasses. These structures, depending on the material, basically the membrane material, they are. Uh, can have a design life of 15 to 30 years, depending on the kind of material that it is. Now, in real life, they show an orthotropic behavior. That means strength in this direction and strength in this direction are not same. Uh, more importantly, the force deformation behavior or load deformation behavior in these two orthogonal directions, the weft and warp direction, are also not same. And here is a schematic representation of how it is. So you can see that in the warp direction, it has a larger modulus, higher stiffness. And in the web direction, it has a lower stiffness. Now, these are very simple structures. People have been building uh, tents for thousands of years. We are familiar with Roman tents. So suddenly, why do you need to look at structural design of these? What's the need of that? So, although they don't seem very complex, but these are large deformation structures. And I hope most of you understand large deformation. And I would uh, recall you back to the situation where you learned that uh, in Euler Bernoulli beam theory, we say that there is no large deformation. So, basically, what I'm trying to say is that whenever we are dealing with a large deformation structure, things get very complex, which we didn't deal with in our regular courses when we learned in our undergraduate studies. So there is some unconventional part in their analysis and design goal. For example, this side, what you get to see is an umbrella getting inverted under very heavy winds. The umbrella is also a anticlastic tensile membrane structures. So uh, even in the inverted shape, you see one curvature like this, and then each one is between the two regions, we'll have a different curvature. Why I need to design them? Uh, one great example you can cite from uh, what happened earlier this year in London. This is the stage of O2 uh, Stadium, uh, the O2 Stadium roof, rather, uh, which had a tensile membrane structures, just pretty celebrated tensile membrane structures. And there's a screenshot uh, after the hurricane happened over London. And you can see what kind of tearing that took place for these structures. So, again, a very well known and uh, quote unquote well designed structure could see failures like this because you know these structures are not so easily understood. We don't uh, know them so well. But on the other hand, you would see uh, tensile membrane structures almost everywhere these days. Even in India, uh, all the new airports, uh, they will have these uh, open uh, covered areas uh, for parking, for uh, loading, unloading, which are covered with tensile membrane structures. All stadiums for cricket or football, the galleries should be covered with tensile membrane structures. So you are using them very often, 
But the question remains that do you really understand them well enough to be able to put them in public structures? Now, uh, when we kind of establish that, yes, we need to understand them well to be able to design them, let's look at what are the challenges in design and what are the design objectives really. So typically, because of the mechanics that's involved, we want them to have homogeneous pre-stress. And also same pre-stress in both directions, that means isotropic pre-stress. This corresponds to the concept of minimal area or minimal shape. Uh, you may not be familiar with this, but you can uh, you can find it to be analog analogous to uh, table behavior. Um, we'll talk more about uh, minimal area, minimal shape, but I don't think we have enough time for that. So in the design, we definitely like to have this uh, homogeneous and isotropic stress as much as possible, which will help the uh, whole membrane properly in our torque condition. Yes, we need to have anticlastic curvature, and uh, these two figures tells you uh, tell you how the anticlastic curvature becomes useful. So, if you look at this figure, when the load is coming vertically from top downward, then the arch action coming from these takes care of the load and holds the membrane in the right condition. On the other hand, these pre stresses, initial pre stresses, don't change. And on this direction, you have these additional stresses coming due to the load here. And uh, what are the typical loads in this? It can be due to rain, it can be due to snow, or most commonly wind. And we know that due to wind, it can also be suction kind of loads, right? It's not always compression and pressure. So what happens when it's suction? Then the stress along the other direction becomes useful. So we have then arch action from this side arch or shell, whatever you want to call it. And there the stresses are taken up in that direction, whereas these stresses remain undisturbed. So we need these sufficient pre-stress, the initial pre-stress sigma i we are writing here, so that these additional stresses don't disturb the stability of this tensile membrane. So we need sufficient pre-stress so that there is no wrinkling uh, let's say if these stresses are enough and we don't have the initial pistols, then it will start to form these kind of wrinkles. You also would like to have a large deflection. So with pistols, we would be able to uh, make it talk so that it doesn't happen. Ponding refers to the uh, condition where uh, water or snow gets collected and uh, creates a pond uh, locally on the tensile membrane. You should always try to avoid that through our design. If the stresses are too high, it can tear the membrane. So while we say that we should have sufficient pre-stress, it should not be such high that it starts tearing the membrane and starts making it weak. And due to our uh, dynamic uh, wind loads, or rather when the wind loads very heavy, there can be fluttering and a lot of noise in this. So that's also something we would like to avoid in designing the tensile membrane structures. And this slide gives you an overall flow of a TMS implementation project. So we start with form finding, maybe a new word to you, but we'll discuss that what it is. Then we go to structural analysis, then you go to structural design, generation of cutting patterns, and then finally uh, fabrication and erection of the tensile membrane structure. So we'll go through this step by step. Let's see how it is. We'll go one by one, not everything in detail. But whatever uh, we feel that uh, need to be so. so now we move on to the next section, which is form finding of tensile membrane structures. What is it? Why do we need to do that? And how do we do it? So what is form finding? It's a new term because when we are dealing with structures in reinforced concrete or steel or even timber, we don't talk about form finding at all. So what is form finding? It's the process of finding the initial shape that is in static equilibrium under particular pistress and boundary condition. So a very typical thing for tensile membrane structure is that we don't know the shape of the structure before we build it. We don't know the shape of the structure before we create the structure. So the, the shape of the structure depends very heavily on the boundaries that we put and the pistress that we put, which is not the case for your typical concrete and steel structures. But I can give you an example which you may be familiar with is that of a cable hanging under an external load. So here the shape of the cable depends on 
how much load we are applying. So the shape follows the implant forces that's there. And by implant, it will be the actual forces in the, table, the tension. And this governing of the shape of the structure by the force is what is known as the dicta that form follows force. And that's also good design objective for any kind of structure. So if you can align the shape of the structure towards the distribution of force, then you get typically the best design, most optimally designed structures. So here also the in-plane forces should be distributed well along the direction of the membrane. That's our goal. And how do you know that it's well distributed? We typically measure the equilibrium to this residual. And there is a way to calculate the residual, which uh, we may briefly touch upon through this lecture. Now, again, coming back to why we need this form finding, the basic reason is that we don't have an initial shape. When we start, we know that, okay, we want a support condition here, another support over here. Maybe even at the high points, we may know where it is. And we may decide that, okay, I'll connect this with a rigid frame support for this. But we don't really know what is the shape of the membrane that it takes between these. This is something which is completely unknown to us. It can have a curvature like this. It can have a curvature like this. And we don't even know which one is good to go ahead with. And form finding kind of gives you an answer to that. What does it depend on? It depends on how much pistis we apply and what are the boundary conditions. And the final shape that we obtain after applying a specific pistis and a specific boundary condition does affect the structure performance significantly. And also it does affect the aesthetics to a certain extent. So uh, uh, some people uh, conjectured that uh, the failure of the O2 arena dome um, was because of having low curvature uh, on one direction, along one direction. Now here I'm trying to show you two examples of what's happening. So this is the pre-stress ratio of the warp to field direction. Uh, and here also same. And these different values, you can see here it's one to one, it's three to one. And that leads to different kind of a curvature in warp direction. So sigma w is changing. We have kept sigma x to the same, and we get different structure. And to the very right, you can see the stress distribution. I'm not sure if you can uh, read the values over here. If you are working on a screen, you can probably uh, pinch and zoom so that you can see what's happening. But you can see the difference in stress distribution that's happening over here. It may not seem significant, but uh, tensile movements are in a narrow range of stresses. So for that, it's actually very, very critical. So what's form finding? You can see from this uh, picture, we start with uh, known boundary conditions like this, or even know that, okay, we are going to put a solid uh, rigid frame like a tubular structure over here, steel pipes typically. But we don't know this, this is unknown. So we start with an uh, initial guess for the form, which is over here, a flat shape, as you can see, around the middle surface. And then through iterations, we go from closer to this, and then the final form form shape is obtained. So this is a mathematical problem, which is applicable not only to things in structures, but for other kind of uh, membrane structures as well. Over years, uh, I would say from uh, mid nineties to now, uh, there have been significant work on uh, coming out with newer and newer form finding methods. And uh, some researchers have categorized them into different classes, uh, into stiffness matrix based methods, which is very similar to uh, what we typically do for structural analysis. Then geometric stiffness methods, because these typically deal with uh, geometrically nonlinear structures with large deformations. We have dynamic equilibrium methods and uh, minimization methods, because you remember that we said that it's based on minimal shape or minimal area. Uh, among these, uh, I have highlighted two cases. One is the dynamic presentation method, or DR, and the updated weight method, or UWM. I'm going to talk a little bit more about these two. Now, what's the problem with uh, form finding? What's the, what are the challenges? What do we, I mean, why is it a complicated thing? Why do we have to do it carefully and at the first go? And what we say is that if you don't do form finding properly, 
the following analysis all go wrong. They are not useful. Now, minimal shares may not always form and it may cause necking. What's necking? Uh, what you get to see over here is a conic structure. Uh, you can also call it a catenoid, but it's uh, let's say it's a conic and uh, it's a square base like this. And there's a head ring. Now, if I keep changing the height of the structure by keeping the plan area same, you can see if we increase the height to this length, the whole membrane collapses to a single line here. This is called necking. So the neck forms over here, starts forming, but here the whole thing just collapses and that's not a practical solution at all. What are the other challenges? Uh, these different formulations sometimes result in slightly different uh, variations of solutions. And even different softwares that are built on this, they also show different solutions. And challenges always uh, remain in the computational robustness of these uh, different methods. And uh, whenever we are using a uh, discretized iterative procedure, then we always face the challenge of convergence. And most of them from funding techniques, uh, they require you to select some parameters. You also have to select the initial shape. And the solution kind of depends on these things. So, which it should not ideally. Ideally, this is a purely geometrical problem. We should not depend on the material or whatever initial shape you select. It should result in the same form form solution, but it does not happen. And for uh, discrimination cases, mesh distortion becomes an issue whenever the shape is somewhat complicated. Many times, uh, because of convergence issues, the computational time can be very, very prohibitive for certain methods. And we have seen that to happen for dynamic realization for any complex geometries. For example, if you have a structure where uh, there is another conic over here, uh, same kind of a conic, let's say, and this part is marked with a cable, then it becomes quite significantly difficult, not double difficult, compared to solving a single conic. Now I come to optimization based form finding using updated weight method. And I have to focus on time here because uh, this is uh, uh, this is a work coming out of one of my uh, PhD students, uh, Alan Marvanian, primarily. And my past PhD students also helped in that. And we are quite proud of this method. That's why I'm putting it here. So what we have tried to do over here is to uh, build a completely optimization method here. And uh, the formulation has quite a bit of newness into it. So it can take care of the membrane energy in this part, and this is coming from the boundary cables. So if it is not frame supported, that means it doesn't have a rigid frame at the base, or rigid frame can be of this shape also, or can be circular as well. But instead, if it has flexible cables, which you want to tighten, it can take care of those structures as well. And most importantly, what the biggest advantage of uh, the method that you have proposed is that it can relate the pseudo cable weights and boundary cable weights to the desired pre-stress in the structure. Now, why is that important? <laughs> the desired pre-stress is important to achieve a good design of the structure. And we typically decide on that, okay, this is the level of pre-stress we want in the final form found structure, initial pre-stress which does not cause those uh, tearing or slacking or ponding or wrinkling, then we want to achieve that. And UWM can do that for you by suitably adjusting this W and the small W. That's the biggest advantage that we have. Uh, this is a schematic of the whole system, how it works. Uh, I don't think it uh, allows me enough time. Um, uh, the complexity of this method is there. Uh, which again uh, should not be discussed now, in my opinion. You can uh, read our work here. I am uh, also leave you with a list of references where you can see the details of this. Rather, we'll focus on these results and tell you, I mean, how it works. So let's start with the uh, uh, right side figure over here. What we are trying to show is uh, the result for a conic structure. So what you see this solid line, the conic can be solved as an analytical solution. So uh, instead of discretized iterative solutions, you can actually find the solution of a conic uh, through mathematics. 
And uh, that line basically represents half of the conics profile. And the result you obtain from UWM, you can see through these blue dots, right? And you can see that they match uh, exactly almost. And we have done it for different dimension, etc. So we are very confident about it. And you also find it our method to be more robust and efficient than conventional method, uh, primarily because it works on uh, all kinds of system. So if you have a TMS which is frame supported or a cable supported, in both cases it works. If you have a minimal surface TMS or a non-minimal surface TMS, then also it works. So uh, just a quick note on what are minimal and what are non-minimal surface TMS is. A simple way to understand is that in this case, uh, the two stresses will be similar. The two stresses will be similar. And in this case, the two different directional cases will not be the same. There are other ways of classifying these two as well, but uh, that's the simple way of understanding this. Uh, in this table uh, over here, what you get to see is a comparison between uh, dynamic relay station, which is very commonly followed by many, adopted by many in uh, design of tensile memory structure, and our method, which is WM. We have applied this for various benchmark and uh, complex structures. So these are typical benchmark structures that people use it for. And this is for a complex structure, which is a twin hyper. Uh, a, a hyper is this shape. Uh, I think we have already seen it a few times. This is a hyper. And a twin hyper, instead of just two high points and two low points, we'll have three high points and three low points. I try to visualize it. I'll show an example of twin hyper later on. So what you get to see is that as the complexity increases, UWM becomes more and more beneficial in use. So you can see the difference between the computational time it takes uh, in DR and EWM. For simpler structure, the difference is not that significant. Sometimes even DR works better. But for complex structures, you can see that we have a much, much better method. And these are the examples that you can see. Uh, so the names are here, you can see. This is a conic, conic with a circular base. And the stresses are shown in these uh, colorful plots. And you can get to see the shape here, the compound shape. Here. And uh, the warp and field directions are also marked. And it's uh, it's a little tricky the way you have to discretize it and have to apply the stresses. But it does work. Not a huge problem. So this is the twin hyper I was talking about. And as you can see, it has a uh, alternative high and low points. And it has three high points and three low points. You can see if you can really read uh, uh, the colorful contour, the stress contours actually show very close range of stresses. So let me see if I can show you clearly. So as you can see, the stresses range from 4.95 to 5.05, which is a very, very narrow range uh, in terms of uh, kilonewton per meter. Uh, we measure stresses in a little different way here. But as you can see, the stress is almost homogeneous. And uh, it's also almost isotopic. This is a simpler uh, hyperstructure. There also you can see how the stresses are. Um, and here you can see this is a cable supported structure. right? So the cable stress is something that also you try to solve. The small W I talked about, which is related to the stress. And uh, this is a square conic, so the base is square. Uh, these four points are in a square fashion, but you have cable here. So this three structure, this one, uh, the square conic, and then this quad conic, which is a combination of four conics. You can see one, two, three, and four. These are the typical structures that you might be able to see, uh, which our method can solve. Uh, even the issues uh, related to distortion, mass distortion, and et cetera. And many methods just don't converge in such situations, but our one uh, actually does, and that's why we are very happy about the result. So these, this is non-minimal, this is non-minimal, even this is non-minimal shape, and it works here, just like it works for the minimal cases. Now we move on to another method uh, that again uh, our research group has worked at IIT Bombay, and this work comes mostly from my uh, PhD research scholar Shona Kabasi's work. 
And uh, uh, what it does is that it uses uh, the technique called physics intramural networks, which is a class of algorithms. And again, it has a bit of optimization into it. And many of you may be familiar with neural network. So what PIN does uh, uh, beyond a typical neural network or NN is that it takes the physics of the problem. So here we are dealing with the differential equation, which is the Euler-Lagrange equation, which can uh, uh, basically mathematically represent the surface of a minimal shape EMS. And we use that using the neural network we will solve for that complicated EMS, which we cannot classically easily solve. That's why people don't target it. But we thought that since you know this Euler-Lagrange equation is there, using the pin we could uh, try, and we can actually get to the compound shape of the structure which is something like this, depending on the structure. So this is the overall uh, approach, and here you can see comparison. Uh, at the top, you see the pin results, and you're comparing it with gear. So this is just a simple shape comparison. You can see that we are trying different kind of shapes from our shape to our twin hyper, and the results are very, very similar. At least visibly, you can see the results are very, very similar. But pin has its advantages. What we found out is that First of all, it gives us accurate form form shapes, which is good. But more importantly, it gives you very low residuals. What are residuals? These are total residuals uh, when you are trying to achieve equilibrium. So low residuals means that you have achieved the equilibrium more closely. The best part of pin is that it's a meshless method. So typical problems that you have with uh, mesh-based methods, uh, like any discretization-based method, uh, like mesh distortion, uh, floating mesh, etc., will not happen for pin because it, it doesn't have any mesh at all. It's just based on those points floating around in a given boundary. It also becomes independent of the initial shape to our great advantage. Also doesn't depend on material properties. Now, uh, theoretically, speaking, uh, theoretically speaking, no form finding technique should depend on the material properties. But many of these algorithms ask you to put some input as material properties because without that, these algorithms don't work. But we, we have been able to uh, reach uh, this goal of our typical classical form finding solution that it should not ask for material properties. And our method was that. And the other, other big advantage of the pin based method is that it doesn't really depend on the complexity or high dimensionality of the structure. Because what it solves for are not uh, nodal forces. It's, it solves for uh, the weights and biases in the neural network. Now I uh, move on to the next section. Uh, I forgot to inform you that if you have question or anything, I think uh, you can put it on chat for now. And we'll try to uh, you know, have a discussion given the time there. We'll discuss about the questions that you have. So next we move on to uh, load analysis uh, of these structures. So what's load analysis? Where do we have load analysis? Where do we have to do load analysis? So we discussed that form finding is the first and very important step for the EMS structures. Finally, you get to know the shape of the structure, right? So you start somewhere, start with the flat because you don't know what it's going to be. And then you read the form found shape of the structure. We are moving from omega zero to omega one. This is the kind of analogous to the unloaded uh, RC or steel structure, which has its own load, that's all. Well, tensile membranes don't have a lot of dead, load, uh, dead weight, but they do carry pistons. Now the load analysis part comes, and when you say load analysis, it means that we want to apply that external load, not pistons, which is in the membrane. Whatever external load we may have, it can be uh, wind or snow or rain, and we want to find out how the structure behaves under that. That's the load analysis part. We'll find a new configuration because it will undergo large deformations. And we'll also find out the stresses in that structure. So again, it's very important in the whole design process. What we did here is that we tried to extend our optimization-based uh, method of form finding to optimization-based load analysis also, so that we can have an integrated scheme of solving things. No, along the same direction, you don't have to change it. And again, we go to the basic principles of uh, structural analysis or structural mechanics. So what we do, we try to minimize the total potential energy. You all have done that in energy methods that you have used. 
is just the formulation which is complicated, but we could do that. And uh, um, I'll not get into the details of the uh, uh, potential formulation over here, but you get the necessary information uh, from these equations. And what we are trying to solve again, uh, what we are trying to minimize is the location of the nodes, or in other words, the shape of the structure by minimizing the potential potential variation. Now, once we develop this method, we we'll try to kind of validate it using more traditional uh, structure analysis techniques like finite element analysis. And we tried to use abacus. There are uh, some initial problems uh, with abacus because uh, uh, it's not easy to do form finding in abacus. In many cases, you it results into non-convergence. So that's the problem. So then we thought that we should not be doing form finding in abacus at all. It's not meant for form finding. You can do form finding, but it's not easy. So we ditched that part. What we did uh, is that we took a solution from updated web method. We took the form found shape, uh, gave it as an input to abacus, and then we could uh, import a mesh also. And then we solve for the initial equilibrium. Okay. So based on the fixed cable boundary or, or solve for the membrane. And then we could apply load just like any other finite element analysis in Abacus. And you could get the results. Results in terms of stresses, results in terms of deformation. Etc. The whole purpose of doing it in Abacus was to be able to compare that the optimization basis based load analysis method that we developed does it give the similar result as in Abacus? And here are comparisons, uh, as you can see. So uh, first, let me get into the numbers. So what the structure we are dealing with here is a flat membrane. You can have flat membrane, which is pistis. And we are applying a point load, consider a point load over here. And then our study is based on these three elements. Note them down, 1, 3, and 11. These are the element numbers. So we are comparing these for this benchmark problem with a previous study uh, for stresses in film and warp directions. So you can see the stresses match exactly the second decimal or close enough. Uh, with Abacus, uh, there is uh, also similar results. So yes, we can uh, do the Abacus based uh, load analysis also which also validates our results uh, because uh, we don't have humanly benchmark problem, but it works. Uh, these are graphical representation of stresses. I'm sorry, graphical representation of uh, uh, deformation in different direction. And you would see that uh, our optimization based load analysis method and abacus based methods give you the same result. Well, uh, the contours are a little different, so it may look a little different, but actually they are quite the same. Again, for the comparison of uh, results uh, of this uh, load analysis, uh, this is a different structure. Uh, it's that uh, cable supported hyperstructure, which is a minimal shape, and we applied load like this. Uh, now, this is the way uh, the American standard says that you have to apply load on the structure. So, we wanted to apply more of a realistic load. And then we study on these elements, these two corner elements, because it's always more difficult to solve at the corners. So these 2, 37, and 48, these uh, color-coded elements are what we are studying. And now we are comparing it with Abacus. So you can see that the results are quite similar. And if you ask me, we have more faith on our method than Abacus because uh, the initial part of Abacus is again obtained from UWM. And uh, that uh, transference from UWM from found solutions to Abacus may be an issue. But again, if we look at the results of stresses here, uh, this is fill and warp stress, this is fill and warp stress in Abacus. So you can see how closely uh, they follow each other. So results are very, very similar. And the uh, deformation in the vertical direction is also very similar. And this is in millimeters, so you can understand 0.0591 and 0.0590 millimeters almost doesn't make any difference for any practical usage. But again, for tensile membrane structures, we have to be more careful than any common kind of structures. After that kind of load analysis, we moved on to more of a complicated problem of the wrinkling membrane. So we said that membranes may form wrinkles if not pistis properly, 
or if the load is of an awkward type we have foreseen and the load is of very high intensity. So here we take a case where we take a flat surface, flat membrane, which is pre-stressed in both directions so that it remains flat. But let's say for whatever accidental reasons, we have two moments here. Now the moment we apply moment, uh, in this part, it should apply compression, right? We all understand that. And the membrane cannot take compression. So what happens is that it forms wrinkles here in this region, wherever you are trying to apply compression, it cannot take compression. So it will distribute the load or the stresses from this part to the upper part instead of taking the compression. But typical analysis will not be able to do that. And you have seen the same situation with cables also, right? Cables also tension only structures, they cannot. Now we just uh, did a symmetrical boundary to simplify the whole uh, analysis. And we got the results. And the results, uh, since this is an analytical, uh, this is a benchmark uh, study, we could do analytical formulation. And this is uh, a comparison of moment curvature, uh, although they are normalized, uh, both moment and curvature, but you can see the solid line of analysis results are very close to what we have got. So the wrinkling also, the effect of wrinkling could be modeled here. And the stresses and the uh, overall moment could be achieved uh, equally to our methodology using the optimization of the potential variation. This is looking at the same result in a different way. We looked at the stress ratio profiles. And again, uh, the solid line represents uh, analytical results. And we say numerical, it's our method. And you would see that for different kind of uh, moment versus force, we could be able to match uh, all these situations. Um, for the consideration of time, I'm not getting into the plots because the contours are a little different. Uh, but what you can see from the left one is that as you increase the uh, as you increase the moment, basically, the compression zone increases. So over it's mm -hmm. here, then for another case, it's here. As you increase the moment, the compression zone, or realistically speaking, the zero force zone, zero stress zone, the wrinkling zone increases, which can also be identified uh, from the plots uh, over here. So here, this is zero stress. The blue represents zero stress here. Uh, over here, uh, zero stress is represented somewhere over here. So this color, which is uh, wrong representation, which is without thinking. Okay? The bottom one is with thinking. Uh, so I'll just uh, pause after this slide. Yeah. So there remains uh, quite a bit of challenge in load analysis. What we are doing, we are happy with that. But more things to be done, uh, particularly material characterization. None of these load analysis uh, take care of material characterization, uh, like the orthotropy in the fabric directions, the fiber directions. We also don't consider nonlinearity or uncertainty in uh, assessing these material properties. The fabric is screened at interchanges. We don't include that. The shape of the wrinkle has not been included yet. What we did is the effect of the wrinkle on the rest of the membrane that we could include. But how the shape of the wrinkle will be that we haven't gotten into because it's completely very heavy and may not serve as much purpose. Also, these membranes uh, for a uh, climate like India's are mostly governed by wind loading. Uh, that's the governing load type. That's, the, uh, that's what uh, determines the shape and the design of the structures. And for wind loading analysis, there are many challenges. For example, these structures don't come with pressure coefficients. You know, For wind load analysis, we deal with C, C3, et cetera, right? Uh, what we have in IH, H, and Part C. For these structures, we don't have it because these structures are very flexible and will see a sufficient wind structure interaction. So unless you study to that great detail, we don't we won't be able to figure out what are the pressures applied on a uh, different kind of uh, shapes and different kind of uh, wind directions. Also, we need to have wind tunnel test along with CFD models to confirm that yes, what our FSI analysis gives are correct results. Then there are issues with fluttering and instability due to fluttering, which happens for high winds and can be appearing like the uh you were in a case. And that will be local instead due to fatigue and carrying as well. So I'll just uh, take a quick pause over here uh, to figure out how much time I have. Uh, please uh, remain there. It's still your time.